I'm back with Ian Shelton of many bands, but most importantly, Military Gun, whose Life Under the Gun is out now. And July 21st and 22nd, they'll be playing in Chicago for the Rumble at All Rise Bowery. I believe that's the new name. Yeah, Brewery, I think is <laughs> brewery. right. Brewery. Brewery. Bowery would be like New York, New York shit. Yeah, I fucked that up already. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, we uh, the album is out now via Loma Vista Records, uh, different pronunciations of it, but that's the one I'm going with. There's some pretty major label mates that you have. Yeah, major label mates, but not technically <laughs> a major, I think is the way that it works. I don't know how you classify it, but yeah. Yeah. Ghost being the, the one that I have been obsessed with. The most excited to... <laughs> I'm going to use the clout to get into a ghost show at some point. Yeah. I mean, you, you got to use it for something. Um, so ghosts out of all of the bands or artists, that's the one that you're like the most excited. No, I mean like Denzel Curry is, is yeah. always been very exciting to me. I mean, action Bronson's on the label. Like it's yeah. Show me the body is like our friends and also a part of like the reason that we ended up over there. So yeah. Uh, I don't know. It's really, you know, Obviously, there's not a hundred, not a hundred percent of artists that I'd listen to, but it's yeah, it's like it's a cool spot to be. There's a lot of weird crossover. If you did say a hundred percent, I would call you a liar. Yeah, <laughs> nobody likes everything. Uh, but with any of these artists, I feel like you have like an in now. You just start with the. Uh, I know someone. I know yeah. someone now. <laughs> you know, I got asked to make a music video for a Loma band, and I was too busy, but I was so bummed that I couldn't. Do it because like that's bigger than anything I've ever directed before, but I had to pass. Who was it? Can you say? I feel like it's a I feel like it's a faux pas to talk about jobs <laughs> that don't happen. You know? Yeah. Well, also it's just it's not it's almost like describing a dream, or it's yeah. like the thing that uh, didn't happen. Um, Life under the gun is out now, and today I I did want to focus predominantly because um, there's so much going on with the album, but I, I want to talk a lot about the lyrics and kind of that aspect of it. But before we go into that, I did want to get a little topical because I did see you praising, I think. Oh, no. Oh, no. The idol. I wasn't praising the (laughs) idol. What happened is I really enjoy the music industry drama. Yes. Of the first episode. Like the first episode, my girlfriend and I were watching it and we're just like, if this is the show, I'm in love with it. Yeah. You know, like her team trying to hide the fact that she's had this scandalous leak was all super interesting. When it, as soon as the weekend appeared on camera and it became Fifty Shades of Grey, it was really, really bad. But (laughs) the music industry drama element, like the second episode is a music video shoot and she's feeling all this pressure and these terrible things and wanting to be anywhere else. Like those are things that I have related to and like, seeing a glimpse inside the music industry before I was involved in it, like was always the most interesting thing in the world to me. Yeah. And I aspire to hopefully someday make something about how weird the music industry is. (laughs) And the, it was, it was inspiring, you know, but then there's the really terrible sex. So I'm not praising it. That's all I'm saying. I'm not praising it, but I'm saying (laughs) that there is a kernel of an amazing show yeah in there i feel as though they've probably stepped all over it and there's no way that the rest of the season is going to be good (laughs) but but you have a theory on why oh so like episode two the weekend he like narrates like all these sexual acts that he wants her to pretend to do by herself while she's like masturbating yeah and you're like this is really weird and awkward to watch. And I feel like both men and women feel that. Like, I don't think people yes. are actually feeling <laughs> turned on or like aroused by this thing. It's just like, this is fucking weird. And you know, like there's a meme of this scene out in the world. Oh, the stretching. Yes. Yeah. 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 And <laughs> my theory is when you're the weekend is the number one artist in the world. I don't on know. Spotify. If, on Spotify. Which which might be which might be paid for I don't know but fifteen million he beats Taylor Swift by fifteen million yeah which by the way I went into a huge thing the other day where I don't know if you've done this game 
I think it's very fun. Uh, you might know too much information, but I was with some friends and we were trying to guess the top 10 most listened to artists on Spotify. And you can get like, I could get like, I know the top three, but I, I don't know. Like the other things that I think would be massive are like 19 in the world. Like, I don't know. Well, one thing that was kind of interesting. So in the top 50, not to sidetrack too much, there's one like legacy artist who hasn't released anything in like 40 years. Uh, and do you think you could guess who it is? Legacy. Hasn't played a show or done anything in like, uh, maybe it's not 40, like 30 years, like a long time. Is it rock or is it it's a it's rock. singer? Oh, it's rock. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, is it, is it the Beatles? No, they're 120. Wow, 120. That's yeah, pretty fucking low. Queen. Queen. Oh, yeah. that makes sense. We we will rock you, Fat Bottom yes. Girls. I bet that gets played everywhere. Yeah, uh, and then there's like Elton John, but I guess he's kind of active. But uh, yeah, the weekend he's done like five retirement tours now. Yes, I think he recently played the Dodger Stadium. Yeah, there was a store at the Grove about it. Oh, really? <laughs> I don't know why, but yeah, a whole store yeah. at the Grove dedicated to Elton John's Dodger Stadium show for like a couple months. Yeah. So the nope. number one artist in the world on in Spotify. This, yeah. So, but when you are that, I think that people pretend to like whatever you like. So his sense of reality is so like, he probably does this with women and like, is like, they love it, you know? Yes. But his perspective is so skewed because people just want his attention no matter what, because he's this massive pop star. Yeah. And so because of that, I don't think he has a perspective on what anyone finds attractive, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. so the fact that he's made this erotic show is going to be cringe because he doesn't have a sense of reality. Yeah. I, I don't know if you have the same experience, but I have the opposite <laughs> where I've come to the realization that every idea I put out there uh, is not received well. <laughs> <laughs> Will be rejected by yes. the world. And uh, because of that, I guess my point of view is that that's just how it is in the world. If I was in that scene and I wrote it, every sexual thing I would say, the uh, woman would just start laughing at me, which actually did happen recently mm -hmm. with my wife. I said something and she started laughing. And then in the moment, she was kind of trying to keep things going. And then later she's like, when you said that thing, that was kind of weird. I was like, oh, yeah, I kind of knew it. You're really was, burying your soul right now. This is... Yeah, well, hey, I'm I'm with someone who I feel like is averse to cynicism, is very sincere. I mean, this album, I don't get any kind of the ironic detachment, whatever category you want to put that stuff in. So I feel very comfortable with you. And so hearing someone say that I'm averse to cynicism means legitimately a lot to me because I <laughs> feel like I do so much to be like not cynical, even though I can be specifically yeah. about music is the one thing that I can be cynical about, but, uh, I try to shake it cause I, but like I, the fact that you noticed or, or, or maybe I've even said it before, but yeah. it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's important to me to be anti cynical. Well, I feel like uh, you are very outspoken about the contemporary artists that you like, whether you're taking them on tour with you or you're talking about them in um, interviews or you're helping with production, uh, like with uh, MS Paint and stuff. So as cynical as you are or can be, I notice more of the, the positive aspect of the things that basically you're recommending that I check out. <laughs> yeah, that's the goal. I mean, you did the MS Paint. Yeah. Interview after I punished you <laughs> saying that you should do the MS Paint interview. Yeah, I did not check out the idol, but you know, the idol. <laughs> okay, watch, check this out. Watch 45 minutes of each episode. Oh my god, this is exactly what my friend said. He was skip the last 15 because <sighs> the last 15 is the sex stuff that yeah. nobody needs. Stick with the weekdays, and then by the time you get to the, the weekend, weekend, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's the work week. The uh, the the ratio works out pretty much exactly of that. So my friend was watching it and we're in like a group chat and he's like, I'm starting the idol. He's like, I'm 30, 40 minutes in. He's like, it's great. I don't know what anyone's talking about. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I heard the weekend was really bad. And he's like, he hasn't showed up yet. And I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah. weekend shows up and he's like, oh, it got bad. And I, I told him, I was like, I think the weekend is going to keep showing up and is going to be a big part of this. <laughs> yeah. So he's like, oh yeah, maybe this isn't going to be good. But I think a lot of people maybe had the experience you had where they were like, oh, this isn't so bad. And then I wasn't even like, it's not so bad. I was like, this fucking rocks. And yeah. then I was like, whoa, this sucks. 
And then the other thing I wanted to ask you about uh, while we're staying topical is because I know you're a big fan of the Beatles. You already brought them up. Yes. <laughs> now we got to uh, go into the AI discussion. <laughs> Well, I was just kind of curious. We're really going to do them all right up the right up yeah. top. Just get AI, all the Beatles. Yeah. Do you, are you interested in having an AI assisted John Lennon vocal track so, on the next military gun album? <laughs> I'm not interested in it being on our album. I'm interested in he, them being able to finish the song that they were trying to. Yeah. And it's funny because uh, I feel like hip hop is already starting to use that AI as a way to separate layers and take out unwanted things from beats because it's just creating stems off of existing non-layered music yeah so it's people are mad as if the ai because what people are confusing this whole thing with is the fake drake songs the fake yeah, like the, the drake weekend song, yeah, right? yeah 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 uh, so it's it's all that stuff that people are confusing <laughs> this with which this is just using the technology to separate two layers in an existing audio file. I'm not mad at it. I pr think they did it a lot on Get Back. Yeah. I mean, this kind of seems like... Uh, I'm wondering if this will come in... Um, in pl oh, yeah. In terms of the visual component of Get Back, I've actually heard criticisms where people were mad with all the upscaling, where they thought... And the same thing happened with um, uh, Peter Jackson with the World War One documentary. Mm-hmm where they made it in color. Yeah, yeah. And I've heard a lot of people from the more historical perspective on things are mad because you're basically making something look uh, like we don't actually know what it looked like in terms of color. Yeah. So yeah. you're actually... It's a false document at that point. Yes. Uh, so I'm wondering, yeah, will this have a big asterisk uh, next to it? But the thing is, if it's really good, I think everyone's going to shut up. <laughs> but it, but so many people will be too confused uh, to actually know what's going on. So it's, 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 yeah, it's people getting, will just be mad because they want to be mad about something. And then I'll listen to the song and be like, nice. And then I'll keep moving with my life. And I know you're going to be touring Europe soon. So I think we know what you're going to be talking about on stage. You're going to be informing the crowds about the Beatles song. I, you are the, <laughs> the spokesperson. So we covered a John Lennon song, um, yeah. And we played London on this past tour and uh, someone was like, play, give me some truth. And then I was like, it's too slow. And then, and then there was like some back and forth between me and this guy. And then uh, I was like, it'd be, a, it'd be like a dishonor to John Lennon if you, and I was like, well, some of you might not even think that he is honorable. <laughs> like it kind of started going down this, this oh, rabbit no. hole in my mind of like, wait, this crowd could be filled with punks that hate John Lennon or yeah. not. Obviously, they were, were requesting a John Lennon cover, but... Yeah, I kind of do wonder, uh, I guess, punks in England, just their relationship with classics like the Beatles versus uh, U.S. Um, I'm also wondering, uh, you know, bands like the Beatles and I guess more alternative stuff like Guided by Voices is a big influence on the music. And of all of the directions, you know, hardcore or post-hardcore go in, have you noticed that fans or peers maybe aren't not, not accepting but they're not as familiar with this kind of music and it's like a little strange where they're like oh i like this aspect i don't know what i'd compare it to and you're like well obviously like the theremin or whatever this is like beatles yeah uh i mean i i can't tell because i don't like my <laughs> bubble's kind of small yeah um you have cool ass friends <laughs> well partially that i mean yeah i mean i have friends that showed me the cool records and yeah. and were literally like i have my friend aaron o'neill who played in lights out he was like texted me one day and he's like hey it's time for you to get into the beatles <laughs> and he was like here's where you're gonna start and here's where you're gonna go after and then he'd be like all right now randomly on a sunday it's like turn yeah. on isn't it a pity by george harrison you know like <laughs> Uh, he was like my guru through that. And my friend Oli showed me got it by voices. I think that those people aren't interested in what we're doing. <laughs> you know, like I don't think they're going home and turning okay. on a military gun record, but, um, I think because I wear the influence on our sleeves and, but at the same time, like our music doesn't actually sound like any of those things. Like we're in, in competent approximation of something else, which is what is like special about punk to me like, yeah. as a genre is it's like, Oh, that band wanted to be another band, but they're incompetent at doing it. So they actually created their own thing entirely. Yeah. I um, mean, I guess that's 
uh, New York hardcore with death metal as a whole, right? Definitely. Or just like <laughs> even the minor threat to bad brains, Cro-Mag to cro to bad brains. Like yeah. all those things where people being like, I just want to do this. And then yeah. being like, turns out we're not very good at doing that. Yeah. Although it's, it's funny. I was actually thinking a lot about uh, these kind of influences and how they affect it. And yeah, there's not like overtly, oh, this sounds like the Beatles. But one thing I was thinking in specific about with Guided by Voices, because I don't think anything on this record stands out to me as like, oh, this is the guided by voices part. But the thing that kind of stood out to me is there's like an economy uh, of sound and there's not a lot of fat. Like it feels like every part on this album has purpose. And to me, that's when I think of guided by voices, it's just like every part of their song, like you can't add to it. <laughs> well, and, and if it gets boring, they just like literally a new song will just happen. Yeah. It's, like a song will just be like, pfft. And all of a sudden, the new songs happen. You're like, well, I guess the tape ran out. <laughs> um, I think that the economy of the songwriting comes from just having a short attention span. Like, yeah. I, I don't want to hear just instruments playing for too long. Like, I, it doesn't do much for me to listen to just in, instrumentation. One, I'm not, like, a great player. I, I just, I don't write that way where it's, like, intriguing to listen to myself play guitar. It's just, like... Do these chords sound nice and can I sing something over it? Yeah. Instead of it being about like making some big solo or, you know, <laughs> I don't know. None of that is, is very interesting to me. So it's just like get in and out of the song as fast as you can. Yeah. You're not getting influenced by God's speedy black emperor. My you're favorite thing is <laughs> looking at the back of the record. Uh, like more, I think more songs start with a one than, than anything else like in the because the run times are printed on the back of the record uh, yeah and so it'll be like 152 156 one you know like i feel like that's a i'm proud of that mark that they're they're short short attention span songs yeah well i think that's also why uh, a word like <laughs> a word like flawless would come into play because there's not there's not much there's no flaws of everything there uh, I wouldn't say that there's flaws. There's no fat. <laughs> okay. It's just, it's trim, you know? Yeah. Well, we're going with two Fs, uh, <laughs> opposite spectrum of the, the F words. Um, in terms of, of your writing, like not the music, but I read a interview where I think you were describing when it comes to writing lyrics that, uh, I mean, please correct me if I'm wrong or elaborate more on this, but that you kind of do more of like a listening to the song and, kind of doing a stream of consciousness whether it's verbal or with like a pen and you kind of put that over the like the instrumentation after it's sort of written yeah i feel like it's it's a pretty standard thing i think with like pop songwriters is like the, you have the instruments and then you just start doing like a scat track you yeah. know like kind of making nonsense and then eventually words start to form out of the nonsense and at best i'll usually have a line written down of like a, the concept of what maybe a song could be or just one like I don't care what you do just do it faster you know like that's yeah. the only lyric I had written down when I started singing on that song yeah and that didn't arrive till the till the bridge um but yeah it's just like meant to be as intuitive and just like so as close to the subconscious as I can yeah some songs require more forethought like a song like sway Two on the record was actually written like i've written i like wrote it out and like made sure all the syllables were the correct amount of syllables for each word that i needed in the song and um so there there is times where it goes the other way but like probably like 80 percent of the songs is all just stream of consciousness and as a result uh when you write like a song and whether it's just that kernel you're talking about or after you flesh it out, do you kind of like reflect on what you wrote as like a, a weird form of self analysis? Like, uh, is there a lot that you're kind of like learning about yourself during this process or <laughs> I feel like at the end of the process, like at the end of like accumulating a bunch of songs, cause you start no you noticing, start noticing recurring the themes. themes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You start noticing like, Oh, I guess that, um, I guess that was bothering me or I guess this was something that I, felt I needed yeah. to talk about um, or your life. You realize your life is under the gun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, the album titles will come for, I already have the next album title and two more after. Oh really? Yeah. And then I like, you know, I'll, I'll, once I get the songs, I'm like, does this album title fit this better? Does this one, <laughs> uh, the life under the gun I knew was the album title. 
since before life under the gun, I probably wrote that down at the same time as I wrote all roads lead to the gun. Yeah. And of, of that song, uh, I mean, obviously there's a lot that stands out to it, but kind of the lyric that I don't know if this is like the underlying theme of the whole album or I'm just reading too into it, but the final line, a life of pursuit ends up pursuing you. I was thinking a lot about that line and kind of how it ties into other songs and, um, I mean, I, I feel like there's a lot in this album with that line. Uh, is, that, is that a line that kind of stood out to you in the same kind of way? or It felt like it put a like a ribbon on everything that I was yeah. trying to say. Because it's like, can I move forward? Can I move on? Can I do any of these things? Like, can I change the way that I am? And acknowledging that if you don't, that, you know, like it's whatever it is, is going to continue happening and and you just really can't outrun can't outrun yourself you can't really outrun anything it's just gonna it's all gonna come back and can't outrun the gun yeah and so it's um is that the next album outrun the gun no 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 i gotta (laughs) i'll say it but you have to censor it okay the next one's gonna be called (laughs) okay i love that also ties into maybe something else we were referring to earlier okay great um but but yeah i don't know it it uh you have to send yeah, 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 yeah. Um, the, but yeah, I don't know. It's it's meant to just distill the entire record as as closely as I can. Yeah. And, but again, it was intuitive. But except uh, the only thing I did know was if it's the if it uses the album title it has to be the closer. That's like a rule that I have. Oh, really? So all roads lead to the gun was originally a twelve song LP, and all roads lead to the gun was the end. But we did it in yeah. two EPs, and it is the last of the two EPs. So life under the gun. It's the twelfth track because that's so why I want the title tracks to yes. be the, the, the closers. The ri- so this is the ribbon in the ribbon. This yeah. is the uh, <laughs> the bumper on the bumper. Um, so I, I was thinking a, a lot. I was like reading the uh, lyrics. One thing I wanted to kind of like point out, and I don't I don't know if you thought about this, but the the first song, "Do It Faster." Uh, actually, I, before I get into that, I just wanted to ask you uh, with "Do It Faster." I kind of texted you a you know a joke that. The lyrics, like you can interpret them as kind of a, a call out to teammates while playing like Fortnite yeah. or some kind of like, uh, you know, Apex or any of these kind of games while they're looting where you're like, please hurry up. We need to third party this other thing. <laughs> and, you know, obviously you knew I was joking, but I wonder if there was just a, a kernel, a little bit of you that was like thinking, man, the way people interpret these songs is so different than I intended is that something that you've thought a lot about like how are people going to interpret these beyond the way I know I I love the the (laughs) misinterpretation different interpretation like it's because I don't ever want it to be objective so the idea that someone comes to me and says like something that I'm like that's out of pocket and crazy (laughs) uh it makes it that much cooler to me um especially I mean a song like do it faster is like I feel like it's like kind of benign. And so yeah. the fact that anyone thinks it means like someone's like, I think it's about relationships. And I was like, definitely. I mean, I guess it is about interpersonal relationship of like wanting something of someone else. But really it's just like, I hate when people are late and I hate <laughs> when <laughs> I hate when uh, things don't move at the pace that I like, that's like a selfish song, you know, like 100%. Yeah. It's just a selfish song. And uh, it's wait, funny. so is this person, are, are they like, Oh, I'm so sick of like when I date, like how long I have to wait to have sex or something. Like, what do they mean? I have no clue what they, <laughs> I have no clue what the hell they faster. Thought. I mean, the only thing I could think of as being in a relationship is, uh, I don't know if this is just like the expectations of gender being in public, but it takes me a lot quicker to get ready than my wife. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I would never tell her to do it faster because that, that's not, I don't know. I keep bringing, I need to stop bringing up honor in this interview. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I, maybe that's what they meant. Maybe it's not no a sex thing. Fucking clue. Were you, by the way, the friend that you were talking to who took it that way? It wasn't Abel, right? The weekend. <laughs> it was not the weekend. <laughs> uh, Abel didn't hit me with that. Yeah, that's fair. Um, so I was like thinking, uh, the I think it's the final line in the song, um, or it's it's the second to last uh, line in the song, or something about you know someone being late and stuff, and how they're always like getting high. And then the next song, very high. And then I was like, okay, so in this song, Ian's talking about how he's like getting high 
and how he's like high. And then I was like, this other song is talking about like, oh, you're getting high. And I was like, wait, is the first song, is this, is this about himself? <laughs> is this well, like so Ian being like, I need to like hurry, like. God, I'm always like dragging my feet. No, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm rudely early to everything in, yeah. in life for the most part. Um like people are like don't show up early to me. Okay. Um and but but at the same time I like that aspect cuz I don't want any song to be ever above a, everything should be a self critique in some way. Yeah. And so I like the idea that it's also <laughs> applicable to me cuz I'm sure there are a lot of people who are waiting on me for something in life and I probably should, you know, do whatever I need to do for others faster instead of being selfish. No, I'm putting the F word on you. Flawless. <laughs> I'm doing that, which by the way, I was a little late today, so I hope this isn't passive aggressive. We had to set up. We had to set up. Okay. So okay. Good. Yeah. I was like, I hey, fuck Ian is making me feel so bad right now. Um, just kidding. Uh, and Oh, I was actually also just, uh, to bounce off of the second song. I was kind of curious uh, in it. It has such like a strong kind of rhythmic bass and it has that lead that kind of comes in over it. It's like such a standout hook. At what point did the hook come into play with writing that song? Did you have like the whole song done and then you guys were like, we need to add like one more thing to kind of spice it up? Or did you already like, did you have the hook initially? The, you're talking about the, the vocal melody or the guitar part? That guitar so the guitar part originally was way more discordant. Oh, really? So the rhythm was always there, but the it was like wah, 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 wah. it yeah. was like meant to be like my iron lung, like the really discordant, yeah, like send off into the chorus. Um, because originally when when we, when I when Will and I wrote it, it yeah. was like he wrote this pop song and we weren't there yet, you know, like. Yeah, it was, uh, but and, and it was the first song he had ever brought to me, and I was like, "Well, I'm gonna like see it through because my yeah. friend brought me a song. I'm gonna record on it." And so to me, I felt like that was also kind of a freeing thing because I almost was like, "There's zero stakes. There's no way this song's getting used." <laughs> uh, and then I just started singing it, same thing as everything else, and I just yeah. had "Pretty Down, Very High" written in my notes, um, which I saw a Smokey the Bear. Like a uh, fire warning and it just said very high. And I was like, very high. That's a song title. Um, and yeah, I don't know. It was shittier before. The song was way shittier. And we've, we've had it for so long. Yeah. Because we kind of figured that the pieces were really good, but we just had, didn't, hadn't executed yet. And so it was like it kept slowly getting better. And that discordant thing changed. And then it got slightly more melodic. And then Nick, um, Nick Kogan, he like try he's like i have an idea for the guitar part and did that what is now the final version yeah and uh but it took us like a really long time to get to to that that one piece was what we kept changing for like <laughs> two years and is that kind of like a a a typical for you guys or is that kind of just like the average uh no, songwriting process it, this was this was like the most tweaked song of any song because we we had this one written probably like june or july of 2020 Okay. And so, and we recorded it for All Roads Lead to the Gun, but we thought it sucked. Taylor Young literally made fun of us until we <laughs> stopped playing it. What? Yeah. That was his job as a producer. He was like, this song fucking sucks. <laughs> fucking throw it in the trash. But that's because he knows you guys so well. Like, he probably doesn't, if... He didn't know everyone else like that. So everyone was like, why is he fucking dick to us? <laughs> like, why is he so rude? But that's also what's so good about the collaboration between him and I. It wasn't yeah. right yet. The yeah. song did suck. And he kept like laughing us out of the room being like, the song sucks. <laughs> and so it was, which, which is the, drove me to my best point of creativity, which is spite. And so to spite Taylor, I made the song as good as I could. <laughs> and then I made him record the final version and now he loves it. Damn. So the Taylor Young, the TY, it's a big thank you. Um, it seems like that actually... See, now the problem, though, is this is like a positive reinforcement for everything that he did. But it is. I mean, that also, <laughs> you know, like had we had we released the original version of Very High, we probably would people would think we suck. Another song that I, I guess I wanted to talk about. Well, this one, I guess a little a little more. But um, track eight, Never Fucked Up Once. Uh, I feel like this song, there's an element of you know, wrongdoing and 
I don't know if this is like a, a zeitgeisty kind of thing right now, but the actual title feels like a little like sarcastic, right? This idea that yeah, like, yeah, yeah. the, the judgment, the, the lack of maybe forgiveness and just kind of this finger pointing element, which I mean, you've already addressed yourself. You're like, yeah, maybe I'm finger pointing a little bit uh, on this album, but I'm also pointing at myself. Yeah. That's um, always the goal. Uh, and yeah, I guess I'm kind of wondering what was the impetus for writing the song instead of me t- <laughs> interpreting it. Like, yeah, let, let's start with, uh, I guess the guy who wrote it. <laughs> so first it started with the instruments because it was like so poppy and bouncy that I was like, well, I can't just sing about anything over, you know, like I didn't yeah. want it to be a, a, like a bullshit song. And so I was like, all right, how do I elevate it with lyrics that, mean something more or you know Subject say matter. something say something that is you know has a little bit of teeth to it and a big thing that i was thinking about around that time was just the idea that a mistake becomes your entire identity yeah and um you know not that we need to have like this insane empathy for everybody but it's just like there's a huge part of what i think about all the time is like i grew up being mistreated you know like i've been abused and and with no doubt like that means at some point in my life i've hurt or abused someone else yeah and then the idea that anyone is above the scrutiny you know like none of us are we're all eligible for the chopping block you know and um so i just wanted to write about something kind of from the perspective of the regret or the fear or or whatever of just like the concept of like something you did carelessly yeah, is now your entire identity. And, and the big thing, there was a a song on the record that was way more conceptually tied to this one. Um, and the chorus was the things you'll never remember are the things I'll never forget, which I think is really the, the heart of all of this is like, it's one person acting carelessly. It's one person acting selfishly. It's acting whatever. And then it, becomes something way deeper to somebody else like that carelessness yeah. and um the bridge is like meant to kind of be like you've run into somebody that's been ousted you know and you're and you're like so how have you been you know like where'd you yeah. go and i've had that i've had that happen multiple times where i run into somebody who who um is no longer in the public <laughs> arena and i treat them with kindness and I, you know whatever and i'm just like how have you been you know because i'm curious like these i'm sure there's many people's names that come to your mind like off top but it's like uh i don't know i wanted to write it from write about it from a more empathetic standpoint not for necessarily the concept of the abuser but just like the the fact that it, it could happen to any of us we've all done something careless we've all done something selfish we've all done things that are like eligible you know yeah especially as men like that's like 100 percent. you know <laughs> well especially uh uh you know i'm 38 and the conversation has definitely widened in the past i don't know five ten years of just like behavior that is not okay and i think a lot of the things that are brought up uh growing up not only were they not known but if anything some of these things were uh put in an entirely different light as things that are positive to to do as a guy yeah and it's like not only is are these things brought up to be like oh no don't do that but these are actually bad so it's hard to not (laughs) look back and you know be like oh yeah maybe I shouldn't have texted you know what, what not to get into specifics but there are things that I think we've all done that maybe weren't great <laughs> well and that's the thing is like i feel like so many people were quick to throw others under the bus and i don't think that we actually had the moment of reflection in mass that that i yeah. think was actually the point of all of these movements and all these things like it's like no we should just be like looking at what we've done in the past and make sure you just don't do it in the future because we can't change what's back there like yeah it, it is only about what's next and um and maybe making amends to people you have to make amends to, but it's, it's, um, I just feel like it was a thing that I don't see people talk about. And obviously I want to say it in an inflammatory way of like never fucked up once is like, who could say they've never fucked up once? Nobody yeah. can say that. I guess someone who's flawless. <laughs> yeah. But... <laughs> which is not me. Uh, yeah. It, it's funny. The, uh, situation in particular you're talking about that's happened to me a few times where I'll see someone and 
I like am fr- or was friendly with them. And then, you know, something happens and I'm like, am I not supposed to say hi to this person? There's like all this stuff where I'm like, am I a bad person for checking in with them? But like also like they're human and I don't know. It's like, it's a very, uh, <laughs> it's like a different, difficult situation to navigate. And it seems like going from a place of empathy is probably like the best way to do it. <laughs> well, so my, a huge like part of my identity and way of seeing the world is, is that like I grew up going to AA meetings with my mom. Um, and so I grew up around flawed people. I grew up around yeah. people who are talking about the mistakes they've made. I've, I've grown up around an empathetic environment toward, you know, like you go to an AA meeting and you, no matter what you did, you're, ex- you're accepted. There. Yeah. And um that environment and that way of seeing things like so and on top of that, you know, like I never had the ability to write off people who wronged me cuz they were the people who raised me, you know, like yeah. like uh and so I kind of always just grew up with this concept of forgiveness due to the program and um yeah, I don't know. So it it's just an interesting thing to to watch culture as a whole treat people as disposable and you're like well they have to like go work somewhere (laughs) you have to you know you have to do something with your life yeah post this moment of of mass shame um and there's not really any sort of conversations around like what we do with that and and the idea that you know like this person is just dead is, yeah. is, you know, we don't speak to them. They, they should commit suicide or whatever. Like that's like kind of the culture surrounding all this. And you're like, it just doesn't gel with me. So I was like, I just wanted to write about it from a different view. Cause yeah. people like Patrick Kinlan write from the, the stance of critiquing the culture surrounding all of the, uh, like outrage and things like that, yeah. which yeah. like, I don't really, there's not any of that in that. I don't want to critique culture. I just wanted to like make it more personal talk about him, the emotional element of it because i think that because and i said it with said i, I did it, it goes did something and said something are the two things like th- and so it's like it could be about something you say it could be about something you did yeah. um and you know we've all regretted re- we all can relate to having said something we, re- we regret and then like dwelling on the idea that you said it and being bummed and then it's like well yeah then imagine that becomes your entire identity yeah, I mean, it's not the the same extent to what you're describing, but it's like you're driving somewhere and you cut someone off because whatever, it's the right angle. And then for all you know, that person for the rest of their day, like it's, I mean, this is a very small yeah, yeah, version yeah. of what you're talking about, but like their whole day and they're going to be talking about it and, you know, who knows what they this did to resolve it. guy in traffic. Yes, yeah. and you don't even think about it. But I guess on a larger level, uh, you know, growing up in a household, at least for me, and I, I don't know if it's the same for you. I know you were kind of referencing abuse, but my dad was very abusive, uh, not sexually, but uh, <laughs> I always f- feel like I have to define it's crazy it. crazy that you yeah. just laughed after saying that. <laughs> well, I, I always, I'm like, oh yeah, my dad was really abusive. And I'm like, if I don't say not sexually, I wonder if people are like, oh, like, what is that? Like, you yeah, know, yeah, the other ways. I don't think people jump to the to the second. Okay. Well, we can move on. We can move past. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and if they do, you know, that's that's fine. Yeah, you can, you can jump however you want. Uh, but yeah, very very like abusive in a lot of ways. You know, he was brought up in New York w- without a dad. His mom was never. You know, whatever. There's all this. There's obviously all the reasoning and justification. Um, but there was like a point in my young adulthood where I was like, oh, I'm never going to talk to him again. Mm-hmm. And then eventually. Um, it's this is also like the most heightened version i was reading something about like um like a holocaust survivor and they were talking about the importance of like for them like forgiving the nazis and all this stuff Mm -hmm. because it's like if you don't forgive you're the one who's living with that and all this stuff so i was like well if (laughs) if they can forgive the nazis i think i could forgive my dad and then eventually all this stuff happened where we started talking again to build a relationship uh you know my dad passed now but many years leading up to his death, we became like really good friends. Yeah. And I also have a good friend in uh, LA, uh, Steve Hernandez. His dad was like super abusive, uh, not sexually that I know of. And it, he talks about the same process of forgiving him. And now like he's really good friends with his dad. And obviously, you know, my dad, and his dad, it's not like they're still doing it Yeah. because that's, I think the thing that people um, kind of struggle the most with, with forgiveness is this idea of forgiving someone who is still actively doing the thing, you know? Yeah, and that, and that, yeah, that. 
So in the program, the, the, the what I learned in the AA meetings is yeah. they, they say um, like resentment is like drinking poison and waiting for someone else to die because at the end of the day, it really only does affect you. All that anger is, is yeah. within you. It's not within somebody else. Um, similarly, you know, like I've had a restraining order against my mother, but my, my mother and I like talk most days and like, you yeah, know, like yeah. but there's points in my life where I was like, yeah, I'll never speak to her again. <laughs> and it's um, ultimately like, making peace with things because again i think that most harm is done in carelessness it's not yeah. pre-planned it's 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 done in these moments of not thinking yeah and so to to them they don't even know that that happened yes and so you can run a laundry list of of things and ways someone else has hurt you and they're going to be like i mean maybe i remember a third you know like especially yeah you put drinking in there as well but it's like <laughs> um so at the end of the day like it's on me to come to terms with whatever the fuck has transpired. Yeah. There's not anyone else to do that for me. I can't, I could, I could, you know, I've tried to be like, do you remember this? Nope. <laughs> yeah. You know? And so it's like, so what do I do with that? I'm let me make you remember it. And like, then make you feel terrible about yourself. <laughs> like is cause then that, then that becomes like, is making someone else feel terrible. What I, makes me feel good. Like, uh, yeah. and so the process is ultimately, yes, just, it's completely internal. It's not a thing that like even really has that much to do with other people. You know, it's like you, you, you have to do that yourself. But also cause you brought up the program and I know uh, apologizing is, is a big part of one of the steps. It almost feels like in a weird way, the act of apologizing sometimes can almost be more, especially if it's many years down the line, can sometimes be more for the person apologizing oh, 100%. than for the other person. And it's something I've thought about where I'm like, oh, this weird thing happened in high school or whatever. Like, should I apologize? But then it's like, well, you don't want to dredge that up for them. I think about that yeah. all the time. I think about that all the time. It kills me. I think about people. I'm like, should I say something? And I was like, no, because really ultimately it's me. It's selfish. Yeah. You know, it, it's just selfish. They At might the not the even day, like, remember it. Disturbing their life <laughs> for your healing is like completely yes. selfish. And so I, I honestly, for the most part, don't believe in like unburdening. I don't believe in like, like coming clean, like all these things, which those are different. Not, I'm not in the program, so I don't fucking, yeah, I don't yeah. do the 12 steps, but you're the, familiar, but yeah. I'm so familiar, but you know, like, <laughs> you know, you have to go and like fucking tell everybody what you've done wrong. You're like, that's for you. You know, like, yeah, you got to live with that. Not don't put it into someone else's brain. Yeah. And I, it's interesting too. It's like dealing with this kind of, I don't know if it's like heady or heavier subject matter, but like putting it through the funnel of a song, like never fucked up once where you're like rhyming and all this stuff. And it's like, but I mean, that's, I guess what, that's what you do with the song, right? Is, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's making medicine taste good is, is hopefully <laughs> the goal with, with, with this song specifically, because I did have such a specific goal of what I want to be taken away from it. Yeah. Um, also I'm kind of curious and maybe it's not as simple as this, but I was guessing when I was listening to this album that the B side, I guess seven through 12, and obviously there's an exception with uh, track nine, but these songs that are less maybe aggressive were these songs that were written later than, um, kind of the more, uh, I guess faster songs that, that lead the album or is it not really? It was kind of interchangeable. Sway 2 might have been the final one written okay. for the album. Um, and that one is definitely, the, the I would say, the softest besides See You Around. See Around, yeah. Um, and yeah, those were definitely late additions. And that was because of, you know, partially being like, I feel there's this hole in the record. And I need to figure out what needs to go there. So, and, the, and both of those were written as me going, I need to write a track nine. Because I knew that I had life, life Under the Gun. So yeah. track nine I referred to as the second to last song. And so it was like, I need a track nine. I need something that ebbs and flows away from the energy to then spike again for the finale of the record. You want to fill the spectrum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, And I think that, you know, like the flow of the record is like each song was kind of written to be in the spot that it is. You know, like yeah. I wrote Do It Faster and I knew that it was track one. And Very High, I always knew it was going to be like the single that we were going to like push the hardest. So I was like, that's a single you push the hardest, track two. You know, like, uh, and try, I kind of built this slowly that way to be like, 
not it didn't wasn't written in sequence, but pretty freaking close to in sequence. Yeah, almost like you're crafting a, a mixtape, and <laughs> but the songs <laughs> don't already exist, so you gotta yeah, like, yeah, yeah. write them. It's to, like to writing a record, I would say. Yes, uh, <laughs> it's like. I wouldn't even say like. I would say it is writing a record. It's, it's interesting. It's, it's so it's interesting when you put that. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of. Uh, I hate to compare it to something else, but that is what that is the most similar uh, situation that I think the parallel. Uh, well, while, while we're talking about you know doing that, there is an exception, and that's track nine, uh, "Big Disappointment," which is re-recorded from yeah. the earlier stuff. And as you're, uh, I guess, writing a record. Uh, why did you put this in there? Is it just this filled the spot better than anything new that you could think of? Or it was that if like I started when the um, con uh, the concept of the record was emerging, I was like, yeah, damn, that's what, exactly what I'm singing about in Big Disappointment, you know. And, and w- one line in particular, I don't know if it's what you're talking about, but the the line, "Try to live my life with nothing to hide and no one to fight." Uh, I don't know why, but that almost feels like. The, uh, I know we we're talking about the ribbon of the whole album, but almost that that those two lines could kind of stand out as being you in the direction of the yeah, album. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and I I mean I view big disappointment as kind of like my mirror in life of like the standard I try to actually hold myself to of if I am doing something and I feel like I shouldn't talk about it, it's like well that's not living your life with nothing to hide. Yeah. You know like. Um, and it kind of feels like a more active mantra than anything, and so. Um, when the concept emerged again, there was a, there was a B side that got, there was a song that got cut that was really the concept of the record. Oh, really? And and it was either one of, one of the, one of the other that were going to kick each other off. It was either going to be a big disappointment or the song, where you been, where you been ultimately musically, not as good, great lyrically, but not there musically. Are you going to release it? Probably not. Okay. I might use the lyrics or pieces later down the line. We'll see. Um, or you might very high it and it'll. Yeah, and maybe change. it'll maybe it'll get right eventually. What did Taylor say about it? Taylor liked it, but we just he didn't like the structure. The structure okay, was weird. Sorry. He didn't like the structure. Um, but yeah, and that was a song that I got better at singing as time went on. Yeah. And so like, and it's our biggest song as far as our live show is concerned. So it was just like. It works that way. Justice from Angel Dust, when I first played it for him, he's like, that song is going to like be talked about for a long time. And so I wanted to make that true. You know, of like, yeah. I wanted to put these things and, and give it the chance to have the legs to continue on with us. And again, I just sing it better than when I recorded it the first time. Yeah. I mean, it's not exactly uh, George Lucas adding the CG scenes to the original trilogy, but there it's is... It's close. A- <laughs> it's not far, I'll yeah. be honest. There's going to be... I imagine people... It's just going to be new fans will like the new version, old fans yeah. will like the old version. We move on. You yes. know, like there'll be discussion about this. That's fine. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's you knew that going into it. And I guess I am curious the 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 riff that kind of bridges uh, <laughs> the the verse into the bridge or whatever. I guess that's just called the bridge. Yeah. Uh, is that riff kind of influenced by, and maybe I'm, you could tell me if I'm totally off base, but. Is it influenced by Modest Mouse? Of course, yeah. Okay, that whole song is like was meant to be. I mean, it's so much more muscular than yeah, yeah, yeah. But but um. But some of the earlier stuff is very muscular. Yeah, yeah. But it no one hundred percent. Yeah, the the single notes specifically. Yeah. There's other songs we've cut that were like. It's funny because I did was asked in an interview recently like you talk a lot about Modest Mouse but I don't really hear it and I'm like, we kind of cut a lot of the <laughs> Modest Mouse songs, like like we they, we they get written and then it's yeah. just like not muscular enough like us doing like soft to that like not big chords like kind of yeah. doesn't suit us so well with my voice i think so yeah, those songs get cut a lot of the time but um yeah definitely that song huge i was in a huge um lonesome crowded west uh That's, period that, when i wrote it so. that album is like if you like that album uh the first time you hear it with the first few songs you're like whoa is this like the greatest album ever and then it just keeps getting good and better and you're just like and then you get to styrofoam boots and you're like <laughs> this is insane you know yeah. like it's such a crazy song yeah so f- the reason why i, I guess I, I was bringing that up is um you know all of the post hardcore you know bands or hardcore bands that you know all the influences and i also just get a little annoyed because i think a lot of 
post-hardcore bands that will cite all of these very vast array of, you know, indie, whatever influences. And then you hear it and you're like, this just sounds like pop punk. I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> uh, I've never heard Modest Mouse in one of these bands. And the first time I heard the song, I was like, oh my God, like that's the influence that uh, I hear or whatever that, that I feel. And uh, sometimes I'll bring this up and to a band and they'll be like, we've never even heard that band. Yeah, so yeah. I, I'm glad that happened. And also it's just, I think that's one of the reasons why uh, military gun kind of stands out in the way it does. And also, I, I know you've talked about this in interviews, but just the importance of having a wide net, a wide array uh, of influences. Yeah. Well, and it's like, there's, there's like little moments like um, seizure of assets. Like when I say they took my car, it's like, I did all these vocal layers <laughs> to be like, I was like, I was like, and I played modest mouse references for Taylor. Cause he doesn't know them. He does not listen yeah. to modest mouse. Um, but I played those things where I'm being like, no, it's like these distant shouty vocals that are separate oh. from the main. And, you know, I was like this, you know, like that song could not sound less like Modest Mouse, but yeah, Isaac Brock is still in there. And it's like, ultimately, I think I'm trying to live my life with nothing to hide and no one to fight could have been an Isaac Brock lyric, you know, like it would be a quote from a character in a song or, you know, like, yeah. It wouldn't be him speaking so directly about it, but he would find a way to make someone else speak so directly within the the song, you yeah. know? Um, Just add a, I guess, like a slight lisp to your voice. And yeah, yeah. Well, ta Taylor up. uncovered that I do have a speech impediment, so I... Oh, really? Yeah, which we'll get into. We don't have to get into it. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll I'll beep it out C -H -S. as we... Is, apparently. Okay. Yeah, that, that's what he made me realize. made me so self-conscious. Yeah, I, well, I've never noticed it, but uh, I mean... Definitely with Modest Mouse, it's hard. It's apparent. It's what makes it so cool. So I was like, damn, I wish I had a list. <laughs> yeah. Um, a lot of bands, I know we're talking about England. They all have kind of this weird impediment. I guess it's like the the English accent. Yeah. But yeah. to me, that's a, an, an impediment. <laughs> so you don't have that. Um, what was it? Oh, uh, I was going to ask you with um, 15. Okay. Um, so... I know with the, the EPs and all the live stuff you guys have done, obviously there's like an, at this point you have a built in audience and I know you guys play with bands that, you know, I know at one point you like played or toured with thrice, right? We did one show. With okay. It was one show. And I know the you, crowd hated us. Okay. Well, that's what I was going to bring work. up. Yeah. If I, a show that sold out before you announced <laughs> on the show is not a show you necessarily want to play. Yeah. Uh, is that something I guess with this, uh, album, maybe reaching more eyes, more ears and stuff. Is that something that you're apprehensive about or excited about? I, I know I was already kind of phrased this question about the interpretations of the lyrics, but it seems like with this album, you know, more people are going to hear your band than ever before. What's your anticipation or lack of with that? Or do you not even think about it? I always <laughs> anticipate haters. That's the only thing I ever think about. I'm like, people are going to be talking shit, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm excited. We've, we've been trying to play eclectic shows since the start of the band because yeah. the hope is that we can appeal to not only people from one distinct identity. We want yeah. to reach people from from anywhere, you know, and, and we are pulling from so many places and trying to put it back out into the world in a way that makes sense to us. And um, yeah, I, I don't know. But mainly the thing I think about is people talking bad about me, which I... <laughs> don't see that much but i'm always in opposite you know like in my head i'm battling these people that don't that i don't even see yeah wait so are these people that are talking poorly about you as a person or are you talking about like as a, a vocalist like your stage presence Any. or just someone's like Any, oh yeah. ian's a fucking dick. definitely definitely <laughs> have the fear of people like oh he sucks at singing i definitely have the fear of people like calling us a type of music that I don't agree that we are. Um, I wonder what that is. It's just the, <laughs> the pop punk stain, you know, like, which oh, I, I think, yeah. you know, people, if you're dismissive, you could call it pop punk. If you're like, I don't, if you're, if you're smart, I think you don't call it that. Yeah. And, and even then it's a thing. I've still not seen anyone call us pop punk, but in my head, yeah, I was gonna, who's calling I'm you fucking that? like, they're out there. They're all in, out in the, I'm going to look out my window. There are people going to be fucking protesting, calling us a pop punk band or something, you know, like, yeah, but it's just like, no, we're just like alternative rock, indie rock, whatever you want to, we're just a rock band. Yeah. Uh, that came from hardcore classic rock band. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I don't know. It's yeah. I'm mainly combating fake haters in my mind at all times. Yeah. Well, I guess that's, uh, 
a symptom of spending a lot of time online. It is. <laughs> it, it's a symptom of, of honestly coming up the way in the Northwest. Yeah. The Northwest is like one of the most passive aggressive. Like, so the, the crazy thing about growing up in the Northwest, I never saw fights at shows. Oh, wow. Okay. In California, you could not relate to that topic at all. Yeah. Because people hash it out. Yeah. I grew instead, up in the Bay Area where there's a lot of fights at shows. Instead, yeah. what people did is they would talk shit on each other for years. You know, like without any resolution, without any degree of maturity of talking about it or just fucking fight and get it over with. Yeah. Um, and because of that, like I kind of grew up scarred by that social dynamic of like people are always, no matter what you do, kind of talking bad because that's the way everyone up there is, you yeah. know, like not everyone, but it was my experience with the social dynamic and specifically like fucking clowns from Olympia, Washington, like that. <laughs> like if you're from Olympia, Washington, like you're probably fucking pathetic as, yeah. a, as a human. Um, and <laughs> that it's, it's just growing up under that, that, that dynamic of just like people are always talking bad about each other. You join a group of people to speak and they're all just talking about somebody else. Cause they all have fucking terrible internal lives. They have nothing going on. So they're yeah. talking about what other people do, you know? And so in my head, I'm so concerned about the, that, which is not relevant to my life anymore. Yeah. Which I feel like doesn't happen as much in LA, but everyone's uh, too busy. Well, also everyone's like too happy. Yeah. What, what I, when I moved to LA, I was just like, I'm so happy. Like everyone's so busy that no one knows I'm here. Yeah. And that, and, and that's what I love. I love privacy. I love solitude. I love just living the life that I like and doing the things that I like, which is making music putting it onto the world. And then I see my best friends and go travel with them. And then we go home and don't see each other for a little bit. And then we yeah. do it again. And, um, the other social dynamics are not relevant or interesting to me. So, but I don't think it's just busyness because in New York, everyone is maybe just as busy, if not busier than LA, but they're all so miserable and they're always like talking shit on each other. So I think <laughs> the weather has something to do with it also. Maybe. Yeah. The sun is the <laughs> cure all maybe. Yeah. Good weather. I mean, it's just, it's a lot harder uh, to be miserable in Los Angeles than I think most areas. Yeah. And I'm not going to say everyone's necessarily happy here, even though I know I led with that, but it's harder to be unhappy here. Yeah, I agree. I've, <laughs> I've not been unhappy here very much. Well, I know you kind of already brought up, I, I meant to ask you when you brought it up, but with the, all the vocal tracks and stuff, uh, sonically, this album, you know, it, it sounds different than the EPs for, for many reasons, but the thing that stood out to me the most beyond it being like more melody for or, or whatever. And, um, God, yeah, there was some quote, I think you said where this was like the sound of this album was something that you were trying to do when you started the band, but now you've guys have finally like reached the, the capability of doing, it. I forget the way you phrased yeah, yeah. it. Um, but yeah, it, it seems like with all these extra vocal tracks and stuff, especially listening to this with headphones, it's like impossible not to hear. Was that something that you kind of, from day one with this album, you were like, how can we add harmonies and do all this stuff uh, to imbue this album for like a, a more rich listen? Well, so we did so many demos of, of everything. Like it yeah. was demoed in full, besides songs like See You and Sway 2, really only got two demos. But it was like, we demoed it multiple times in full to for me to work on it. To, to get better, to re-record the vocal, to to, okay. to do so many iterations. And then it was changing keys to make my vocal work better within the songs. And um, it was a huge, huge part of the... I think my little brother's about to walk in. <laughs> it was a... Uh, it was like the entire process. Like, you know, like the record, the instrumentals barely changed from, from first writing to, yeah. to finale. And um, that was like the, the whole process. And then we had done it so many times that it was kind of boring again. You know, like you, you, we'd done so many versions. Yeah. And so the harmonies was like, well, how can I make it sound new to me yeah. again? And, and that was a huge part with bringing uh, James from Daisy in. And he did all the harmonies on the record. And then um, Pretty Maddie did harmonies on Return Policy. So it was just like inviting collaborators in that know more because I didn't know how to write a harmony. I'm still learning. Um, <laughs> and But that's James. You know, James did that. Yeah. And I guess just not being too precious, which kind of seems like 
the MO, I don't know if it's military gun or you, but very much like inviting friends, collaborators, and kind of just making the best product possible rather than, oh, this all needs to be me, like the ego aspect. No, well, it doesn't matter. People, I learned from RJC that no matter what other people wrote, it was people thought it was me. Okay. So, right. So at that point, it doesn't matter whether or not I've written the song because people yeah. are assuming it's me. So the <laughs> ego, it, like it's way better for the ego to be like, I'll take your great idea <laughs> and I'll put it in the song because yeah. people are going to just think it was me. <laughs> like that makes it very easy. Not that that's the motivation, but it's just like, I could be motivated by like seeming like an auteur songwriter or something, but it like, Ultimately, collaboration does make things great. And sometimes you have the base level of a great idea and then take someone else pushing it over the edge to really make yeah. it good, you know, good or great. And um, it's about knowing the times to I don't feel like I'm ever saying no. I feel like people aren't really pitching too many things to me. <laughs> so I don't know. But obviously, like their input helps. And James gets brought in and yeah. makes things way better. I love James. Uh, I mean, you guys have collaborated uh, in in writing a, an entire song together i believe uh i have an entire know. album too. yeah oh what <laughs> yeah what what is this someday okay do i have to bleep this out or no no you can leave it in because i'll want people to tell kind of the little easter egg at the yeah, end. yeah okay uh it's so funny that we got as far as we did talking about life under the gun and i didn't punish you about movie stuff at all like we didn't even uh, get into that which uh, I, I don't know if you were anticipating like more <laughs> movie discussion but uh, I guess that'll be another part episode. two yeah part two uh, which I would say what part two is but I don't have to bleep it out yeah the, the name of the uh, the follow-up album uh, besides uh, life from the gun which is out now uh, available on all streaming services etc cetera, etc cetera, uh, Ian was there anything that you wanted to shout out or plug MS paint MS Paint. MS Paint always. Yeah. Mississippi. <laughs> it's one of my favorite albums of the, the year, but then I said I don't want to choose between that and I guess the album that we're talking about. Oh, I mean, it's a it's a tie. Okay. Tie goes to the, the runner. Uh, <laughs> and on that note, Z-Man out. <laughs> I usually don't have to sit with someone when I say that. <laughs>